Hi, welcome back to Coding Shorts. My name is Sean Wildermuth. Before we get started, I wanted to talk about a couple of classes I'm going to be teaching. I'll be teaching an ASP.NET Core course online on April 11th through 13th, and then I'll be doing a VIEW course also online from May 9th through 11th. Check out the link in the notes if you're interested in taking our course from me. So I've done a few blog posts and even I think a video or two about structuring or architecting how you're going to be using minimal APIs. And while working with a client trying to tackle some of these same issues, I decided to codify that into an actual NuGet package that you can use yourself. But I want to show you what I'm up to and where I've sort of left myself, as well as a couple of caveats. So you can use it if you want to, if you have a better method, continue doing that. It's not the perfect method. I'm hoping to get some feedback to help me improve what I'm trying to do. Let's get started. So we're here in Visual Studio Code, and I've got a little demo API. And this API works by just using minimal API in sort of the same way you would. If you've used minimal API in .NET 7, you'll recognize this map group as a way to sort of bundle these together. And for an API that just has one entity, like a microservice, this is fine. This is all we really want is something really small. But as these applications grow larger or you're not building microservices, this might not be a great idea to put them all in one giant program file. You know, right now we're only at like 50 lines, no problem. But once you start to get into related entities and other things, this can really become a problem. So one of the ideas I've had is to start to take these and put them in their own classes that I've called API classes. And so if I start a new file, and I'll call this in the APIs directory, which I created earlier, and I'll just call this the films api.cs. I'll go ahead and give it some boilerplate of demo api.apis, right? We'll just do that. And then we'll do a quick class generation. I'll make this a public class. And while I could do this with statics, I'm actually doing this so we can rely on dependency injection to allow us to do what we want. And I'm going to be implementing an interface called iAPI. Now iAPI, when I try to resolve it, it actually points us at a package called Wilderminds Minimal API Discovery. This is the package we've added. Now what's interesting about this, let me go ahead and save that using statement and go ahead and implement this interface. There's only one call and that's to register. Register is gonna be handed that web application and then it's gonna go ahead and use it here to register the APIs that are in this group of objects. And in our case, this is gonna be all of this from group all the way down to the post, right? And let's just get rid of those for the minute. And I'm just gonna put them in here, right? So we're essentially gonna create the group from the app. And let's bring in some dependency using statements. Hopefully that will be the last one. And let's just indent this a little so we have it nice and simple. Now we still have all of this code just sitting there and that might be okay, but there won't be much more than this because in my case, I'm wrapping them around the idea of an entity, which is films. So you could certainly wrap these in any way you want to choose them, right? You might want, in certain cases, to have all the queries in one place and all the modification of data in the other. That's up to you. This is really trying to give you that sense. And so this should be no different, except that we need to figure out how to register this, right? If we go back to program.cs, you could go and say builder.services.add, let's say transient films API, bring in that namespace again, and then all I would really need to do is app.services.get required service films API. And let's actually go ahead and say that iAPI is going to be the interface we're looking for because that's all we really need, right? Var an API. We get that, and then we could just say an API.register app, right? And this should work. This is not doing anything special except we have this interface that we've defined, which is super, super simple, right? Just an API has one register. Now that we have all this set up, I'm gonna make sure that my project is still running. I'm using a .NET watch behind the scenes. So I'll just do Control-R to make sure it rebuilds just in case. 
Most of the time, we won't need to do that. But because it's program.cs, sometimes it's a little flaky about injecting. It injects the code, but doesn't get executed again. And if we go over to a Thunder client, Thunder client is an extension here in Visual Studio Code that has a Postman-like interface. And I've got the call to get all the films, which is in there. And we can see it still works, even though we've moved it into this API, right? Now, we're going to run into the same problem if we suddenly have a ton of these. If we have a small handful of these, I could say services here, right? And say for each, the IntelliSense is killing me. API in APIs, and let's go ahead and just change this to APIs. API.register, right? I could do the same thing, assuming that we might have more than one. But then doing all this can be, let's remember we have all the APIs and do the right thing. That's all great. What I'm doing instead is I'm actually going to replace these with the other part of the API discovery, and that is being able to say builder.services add APIs. This says go and find every class in all of the assemblies by default that implement iAPI and register them with the service layer, right? Now this has some overloads that allow you to pass in one or more APIs and allows you to set the lifetime Though we are using transient by default. And to actually call register, we're just saying app.mapAPIs. This has the same idea, but all this does is do exactly the same sort of code that I was gonna do earlier, right? So let's go ahead and force this to rebuild, because again, we may be changing things in program.cs. Everywhere else it continues to rebuild correctly, but program.cs, because it's the startup, doesn't always work. So if we go back here, we should see it continues to work, right? Because we did all of that. And let's talk about what we're doing here, right? We're doing the idea of creating a group, mapping get, calling, extensions there that we may need for adding authorization or other things. And this is all fine. If this is the style of what you want to do, it's absolutely fine. But we do have a limitation. What if instead of bool passed here, we wanted to say false. We wanted to have a default here. Problem is in lambdas, you can't have default members. Might be fixed in a future version of C sharp, but this is the case we're in right now is that the idea that we might have default values kind of falls apart in here. Now I've gotten over it by using a bool question mark or nullable bool so that I can figure out and have a default inside my get by year. So in fact, this will be null by default, which is certainly something that is fine for me, but it's something you'll have to deal with. But what if instead we took all this code and just said get one, right? Now it's complaining because we're gonna create a public async task i result, and we'll call it get one. Oh, forgot about that little piece, right? So are there are times when you might want to do this where you just want to specify the actual methods and have full class methods to do this. This injection of the parameters works in the same way, but of course we could say no, and that would be perfectly okay, or false if that's what you'd like, right? This does get closer to what controllers are, and you may just want to use controllers, but I like that we have some different ideas here. Now, when we start to get into controllers, right, I might go, you know what? All these things seem to need an async vector repository, right? We're using it all over the place. So instinctually, I might go, let's create a constructor that passes in a vector. Let's call it a repository or let's say repo here. And then let's go ahead and create a field for repo. And then we should be able to get rid of this everywhere, right? This should continue to work because that's a member of the class that it just gets. And this works if we go back over here and we call send, it works perfectly. But we actually have a problem. If we go back and look at our build script, you see there's a warning here. Constructor injection on classes through the IAPI can cause a long-lived singleton. That class you're dealing with ends up living the entire time. More importantly, our repository is going to live that entire time, right? Because what happens here? When we look at this film's API, what is really going on here is we're creating this repository class only during startup. 
we're never using this startup class again. And so what happens here in the methods? We're essentially saying, oh, you know what? We need this map get and we may be injecting it here, but if we're not injecting it, what is it doing? How is it getting this repo? It's getting it from the instance of the class that has to live for as long as this Lambda lives. It's a closure, right? Because of this, if you use this system, not something like controllers that are created per call, then this is going to cause Vecto repository to live forever and be reused forever. And both of those might have state issues. So it's not really what you want. You want to really go back and use method injection, which is what all of these do here, as long as you put it in the right place. Make sure it's still building right. And notice there's no warning here because you're not running into that. And so if we go back here, we can still call films. Films, let's say 2003. That is strange that it's getting 2009. I think there's a bug in my other code. That is very strange. Let's go ahead and say past equals true. And you'll see that we're gonna get past equals true on all of these, even though we're for some reason getting that wrong date. But that more importantly, before I post this up as an example, I'll make sure and uh, make the year work. I'm not sure what's going on there, but we'll figure it out. This API is still working, even though we're using this new method, no singleton created. It's really just using in our case here, we're talking about using the method as just a closure into this, whereas we can use a natural Lambda here and do that same thing. And so it's really up to you how you use this, why you want to use it, in what way you want to use it. But I'm hoping that the NuGet package might actually help you organize these things in a sane way. The trick here is that the organization doesn't really matter how you organize. Use this, don't use it, it doesn't matter. But have some organization. Please don't end up with a program.cs that is a thousand lines long because you've decided to include them all in that one place. Most people aren't doing that. They're finding other ways to do it. But I'm hoping this might be an easy way so that your program.cs can discover your APIs and register them and then discover them and actually call the method so that it'll map all your APIs. So you've gotten this far, of course, I'm going to ask you to like and subscribe. I'll also mention that down in the show notes, there'll be a link to my new courses on ASP.NET Core, as well as a second one on Vue using Vite. And if you want to take a class by me, they're all online. They're going to be completely led by me, and they're half a day long for three days because more than five hours staring at a Zoom screen, most people aren't going to love that. There will be labs that you do as part of the course, so it'll be some lecture, some demo, and then you'll walk through the things we've learned hands-on, get your hands dirty with actual code. It's been Sean Wilding with For Coding Shorts. Thanks for joining me.